because the founders of this university were trying to understand and explain and find a way to solve the problem that they saw that such a wonderful country with exceptional people that was blessed with natural resources, good climate, yet it remained very poor. And the answer to those, that question, why, is really why this university was founded. The beginning of the understanding of the necessity for people to be free to choose their own destiny so that they will bring up other people with them. And this is the great uh, uh, achievement of this university. Now, so we all know this. UFM is the center of excellence. Excellent students, excellent professors, excellent facilities. I mean, the facilities here would make many universities in the United States envious of the high quality. The reason that it is excellent is the mission statement. The mission statement draws professors and hopefully students and the parents of students to be associated with this fine institution. So at the heart of the mission statement is you. How do we make you part of a more free society? And this is what I want to talk about today. And um, to try to give you some ideas on how, to, we can, how we can communicate this mission statement to a wider audience. Uh, throughout Guatemala. So, the, what I will do is I'll try to, well, I'm an economist, sorry, so I have to start with a bit of economics. We'll talk about scarcity as the essential problem of humanity. And from that, I will develop a, a certain set of ideas about the nature of how we act and interact with one another. So, human liberty and personal dignity that is, to have a dignified life uh, so that we can share in prosperity because prosperity that is for the few is not really a, a good system, one that uh, will attract supporters. And I'm going to try to find out why your generation, and I suppose everyone here was born after 1997, uh, that why there is this flirtation among your fellow generation members, why they are attracted to socialism or some form of collectivism, and to try to, to find ways to defend against that. Because I do think that socialism constitutes a systemic poison. It poisons people's thinking, it poisons their lives, it destroys their livelihoods, so we'll get into that. Now, so in order to lure people away from these temptations toward, of socialism, we've got to be able to communicate the ideas of this university, for example, much better than we have done in the past. I failed because I haven't convinced everyone. So this is my sort of life purpose. I want to convince everyone of my ideas. Well, I fail, but I hope you'll do better than me. So what we're going to look at is both the material, but also the moral impacts of individual freedom, because human liberty is not only about enriching yourself, making your life better. Now, whenever we want to communicate ideas to other people, they have to be realistic. They have to have some sort of agreement with reality, or they just don't make sense to people. Unfortunately, socialists are better able, in many ways, of packaging their ideas to disguise the fact that much of the socialist goals actually, actually violate humanity. They violate human values. 
And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about those uh, values. Now, every good economist begins understanding not just the economy, but I believe life itself from the perspective of understanding scarcity. Scarcity is this condition that really defines our existence. And the most obvious aspect of scarcity is the scarcity of your time. The fact that you are a mortal being, that you will not live forever. Now, recognizing that gives a certain urgency to life. That is, we realize, well, if I don't live forever, then I'm, I really, I should go to Model King now. Don't wait until a hundred years from now. I want to begin living my life as soon as possible, fulfilling my dreams, discovering things. So scarcity really is what makes us act. Because if we weren't facing scarcity, we could just sort of wait for things to happen. So it's critical to begin economic, I think, in fact, all social inquiries with an understanding of scarcity. So now scarcity means that there's conflict over the use of resources. The conflict of you being here is that you could be in Zona Viva, right? You can't, well, my grandmother's a smart lady. She always said you can't be in two places at one time. I've tried to disprove that, but she's been right up till now. Now, so this is a real problem. This is a conflict. I have a desire to have time with my friends. I have a requirement to meet certain um, uh, credits for the Model King. Now, how do we solve these conflicts? Well, these conflicts in a grand scale are all about humans interacting with one another, trying to solve these conflicts. And it gives us what we could call a social order. That is the system within which we interact with one another. That's what a social order would be. Now, another aspect that is critical to being a good economist is to understand the nature and impact of incentives. So incentives are the payoffs or penalties associated with certain behavior, the rewards or the punishments, right? So uh, now it's only when we understand the importance of incentives that we can understand how public policies, how politics, how the general framework of gov political governance impacts upon our decisions. Because if governments set uh, policies that create bad incentives that encourage people to do stupid things or to do destructive things, then we have bad outcomes. We complicate our lives unnecessarily as we're trying to somehow deal with these conflicts created by scarcity. So we face a challenge. Now, economists have done a pretty bad job of this, I think. I, I grew up under the Chicago School influences, and you may have learned a bit about these uh, uh, ideas and theories that came from the Chicago School. Milton Friedman, George Stigler, Gary Becker, people that have been associated with the university, they have attained the highest levels of achievement in the economics profession, and they came to this university. Uh, and this university was both honored by having them and honored them by inviting them. Now, but they didn't do as good a job at explaining economics as Ludwig von Mises or Hayek who you have also had some exposure to. The, these individuals and the school of economics that they are a member of, the Austrian school, uh, provide us with a much better understanding of the real world and give us a better defense for liberty, much better than the Chicago school did. I thought the Chicago school provided adequate argumentation, but I discovered through my own investigations that they did not. So now, on one hand, we're often exposed to slogans or memes. Your generation is good at memes, I suppose. You see them every day. 
but they really don't provide substance. They tend to be unstable. And in fact, a meme is probably directed towards someone who agrees with you. And it's not obvious to someone who disagrees with you. So they have very limited purpose. And in fact, propaganda is dangerous because propaganda is really about censorship. Propaganda is not about argumentation, not about uh, uh, logic. It's about compelling people to follow a certain set of ideas. And you have to censor people in order to get there. Now, so for example, property is theft is a slogan of the left. It was a, an, an idea introduced by uh, fo followers of Proudhon. Uh, and, and then taxation is theft. Now, they both will appeal to people that agree with that idea. And they go, oh, okay. But everyone else is puzzled by it. So one of, I think one of the difficulties of promoting the ideas that I'm going to discuss today or that you embrace, hopefully, from your studies here, is that it requires a relatively long attention span because these are careful arguments. I mean, these are philosophical. They, they, they tend to be, uh, they require some sort of uh, underpinning understandings. They go beyond memes. They go beyond slogans, beyond flags and so on. What we are faced with also is the difficulty that many of the things that we understand or would try to explain to people are counterintuitive. They don't, they, they're not obvious to people. In fact, they, many people would have believed the opposite until you give them some new information. So, for example, self-interest. Well, you may have seen the, uh, a film called Wall Street. It was a long time ago. Maybe you haven't seen it. But in this movie, it is one of the most destructive interpretations of the, of the reality of the market. The idea was that for every winner, there's a loser. And this is not true in the free and open competitive market. In a free and open competitive market, for every winner, there's another winner. Because no one engages in voluntary exchange unless they expect to be better off after the fact than they were before the trade. So self-interest and our operations and our interactions in the market actually lead to social gains. And this doesn't somehow immediately, is, is not immediately obvious to people, especially when most of you, when you think about competition, think about El Clasico with the most recent disastrous result. I don't know how Madrid must have cheated. I didn't watch the match, but uh, they're always supposed to lose. But anyway, so, but sports competitions are one winner, one loser. But in the market, competition in the market leads to winners. Because markets are really all about humans cooperating with other humans. You're trying to find someone to make your life better. You go to Gitan because you think they have a better coffee than e-cafe. And you're cooperating with a barista to have that latte or whatever it is you want. So another thing is that markets emerge from a selfish desire to be made better off. But in order to be successful in the market, you have to behave virtuously. You have to be a moral being. You have to be honest. You have to be punctual. You have to fulfill your promises. You have to be good at what you do. This creates greater social harmony. So, but the market is not only about material benefits to society, but it also creates a more moral and virtuous group of people. Because success in the market requires that. And market interactions encourage it and punish those who 
would misbehave. What is it all about, this human liberty and personal dignity? What's so great about that? If we think about the economic side, it's only one aspect of a broader project. Now, of course, we, in your economics class, we talk a great deal about free markets and so on and how the economy delivers certain things. But it's only one element. It's an important element. And in fact, you can't really separate those elements because economic liberty requires civic liberty, which requires political liberty. It's all a package. Now, so free markets are really a means to deliver and sort of guarantee human liberty rather than being an end in itself. So the people who are critics of this university say, oh, those are only these grubby, nasty capitalists. They only care about economics. In fact, that's not true. I mean, we all know you've, in, you've engaged in many discussions about different civic liberties and, and the freedom to be who you want to be. So one of the other things is capitalism is not an ism. Socialism is a belief in the absence of private property ownership. Now, capitalism isn't an ism. It's not a belief system. It's an economic system. So many capitalists, George Soros, are actually socialists. So, I mean, being a capitalist doesn't come with any kind of belief system other than a belief in if you are... Well, even if you don't incorporate it into your thinking, you do understand that more human liberty will make you richer as a capitalist. So then you can use your money to do whatever you want, like George Soros supports lots of so-called progressive causes, even though he's a capitalist in a successful way. Uh, so capital owners often do embrace capitalism. Now, private property rights... And economic freedom are essential if we're going to be free and if we want to achieve our life purposes. That's what self-actualization is about. To actualize the self, to be ourselves. Now, these cannot be separated because if someone takes away my private property, it's as though I am their slave, right? They, they've acquired whatever it is that I have a work to produce and to own. They've taken away from me just the way a slave master would do that the slave would have to plant and pick cotton. Then you take it away from them. Well, if I have a, a, a mobile phone and someone takes it from me, it's as though they've enslaved me for their purposes, for whatever time it took me to earn the income to buy this. This is why theft is immoral, because it's a kind of a, a, an enslavement. So you, we really can't separate private property from being human. Because if you're a human, you want to improve your life. Now, that's not very controversial. I mean, most people wake up in the morning and go, ah, I want to have a worse life. Right? I want my family to have a terrible time. No! People wake up. Now, I, if, if, if I'm ambitious, if, if people give me an opportunity to get out of my way, give me the... Uh, I, I'll make my life better. I'll make my friends' lives better. I'll make my family... This is human nature. Now, you need property, security of property. Property is the basis of all rights of all humans. If we cannot provide secure property rights, we cannot ensure human liberty in a meaningful way. And this is one of the great tragedies of political governance, which has become a system of dispossessing people of their private property, very often their income in particular, in order to achieve certain political or ideological goals. So what we found over time, unfortunately, democracy has become a, a mechanism that weakens our security of our private property. 
Because what happens is that the majority can decide over the who gets what. And that is arbitrary, not based upon uh, your capacities to produce or your genius or whatever, just based upon some arbitrary political decision. One of the things that we talk a great deal about here at Marroquin is the rule of law, the Estado de Derecho. This is something that we need to understand. First, private property must be sacred within our political system of political governance. And in order for that to make sense, we have to treat everyone equally. Women should not have more or less rights than men. Your rights are based upon your humanity, not your identity. And unfortunately, again, this is a problem with political governance. We've seen governance develop as a way of rewarding people for identity, subsidizing them for their identity, providing them privileges because of their identity. But the only meaningful identity is that you're human. Because otherwise, this opens up the possibilities for mistreatment based upon identity identity, the way that the National Socialists did in Germany against the Jews and the gypsies. They just murdered them. They get, said, well, your identity des- determines your, your life outcome. Sorry. Your identity must be human. Now, the support for property rights and economic freedom, these go hand in hand, but it requires a certain acceptance. Again, that people don't understand that, again, humans, we're a trading species. Most of us, even if we lived in very primitive civilizations, would discover very quickly that it's not easy to provide everything that we might want. Whether, and it could be something a spiritual, like affection, right? Affection is the reaction of other people to you, interacting with them that they like you or dislike you. So because we are social human beings, we look to other people to help us achieve and to to live a better life. So we cannot have this creation of wealth, and it must be shared wealth. And it will be shared in the sense that if we engage in voluntary trade, you become wealthier by buying from me, and I become wealthier by trading with you. This is the nature of trade. Because th- th- imagine that these are the only two objects that exist in the world. There's no more production. And you own this, and I own that. Now, the mere act of trading, the reason I trade is that I think that what you have is worth more to me than what I have. Now, that act of trade as if by magic, increased wealth, even though production didn't change. Wow! So trade is itself a wealth-creating process, like magic. All you had to do was find somebody that has something you want. Voila! Okay, so now the moral basis and the outcomes of market capitalism and voluntarism are just as important as the material gains. And this is where I think we win the argument, or we lose the argument. If we only argue for economic freedoms, then you say, oh, you're protecting the rich. But if you say, no, we are worried, we we are concerned about the condition of humanity, of humans as their lives are lived. This is what? This is where we engage people and win the argument. So here we are. This is you guys. Now, I think all of us, when we're young, have a desire to be active. Okay. Now, some, and I think increasingly, have a certain sense of guilt because you feel privileged in a certain sense that that you were born into a certain family or you were born in this wonderful country. I mean, that's a privilege. But then we have to explore, should we feel guilty about 
the conditions of life that we were given. I mean, you're younger than me. That's a condition. Should you feel guilty that you're younger than me? You're better looking than me. You're faster or whatever. You're more intelligent than me. Should you feel guilty about that? What, what is the origin of this guilt that I, seems to be expressed by many people in Generation Z? Now, the reason I say that they seem to feel guilty is that they are too easily attracted to redistribution ideas to sort of remedy or reduce inequality. Well, how would we reduce the inequality of the age difference between you and me? Well, you had nothing to do with it. I lock you in a, in a room for 20 years until you... Well, it doesn't work either, does it? But anyway, I think when I... In my own personal experience, and being a professor for a long time, young people are seeking respect. Now, you know, because when you... You're part of a family, and you're always under the influence and the pressure from the parents or maybe older siblings or whatever. So you're always struggling to sort of stand out, to be, to be yourself, to be appreciated, to be respected, to be part of this. all. And you want more interactions. And the reason is, the one thing that is missing in life when you're very young is power. You're powerless. Go to bed. You know, come home at nine o'clock, whatever it is, you're powerless. You've, and this is something that, you know, you have to be in school. And when you're in school, you have to sit down and you have to be quiet. So young people are struggling with this powerlessness. And then once you become more mature and you're able to escape some of those, those limits that are placed upon you, you begin to try to find a way to be active, to be noticed, to be part of the system. Or part of the thing. So what I want to encourage you is that to channel the activism that is an instinctive thing in young people towards supporting freedom, human liberty. But we need to provide, as I mentioned a moment ago, evidence, argumentation that it's morally superior to live a life where human liberty is maximized under the condition that you're responsible. Because that, remember that's the mission statement. Free and responsible individuals. Remember the mission statement. Okay, now, so how do students get involved? Well, I think there is a Students for Liberty chapter here, but I, I don't know that it's all that active. But Students for Liberty, Estudiantes por la Libertad, they provide an opportunity for you to meet people that have similar ideas, but you could also use that as a vehicle to be more activist oriented. And I'm going to give you some suggestions on what might be done. Now, what you might engage in and be aware of is that freedom of speech, which is an inalienable right of a human being. It is part of your identity as a human that you uh, be allowed to speak and think the way you wish. To keep the state out of religion. Of course, this is not such a big problem, perhaps, in this country. Abolish licensing. Now, licensing, maybe not necessarily in, for driving, but licensing for professions, for occupations. So, occupational licenses. Support livelihood issues. Um, that is, encourage people who are trying to improve their lives in a peaceful and legal way, rather than applauding politicians and bureaucrats whose livelihood depends upon taking it away from you. This is unfortunate. And more tolerance. I mean, these are things that, these are attributes. Um, tolerance is an attribute of, of people who love liberty, that you're tolerant of other people because you love their liberty as much as you love yours. Now, identifying injustices, I mean, there are lots of regulation, lots of legislation uh, that, that creates injustices that make it difficult for people to earn livelihoods. The minimum wage, for example, 
makes it difficult for people with low levels of skills to find jobs. The intention is to make people who have jobs earn more, but the result is usually that it makes it difficult for the low-skilled people to have a job at all. So the, what happens with minimum wage is that the minimum wage for the unskilled is actually zero because they don't get hired. So these things need to be discussed. Of course, judicial corruption is a special case in that regard. Um, and there may be some of that in this country. I'm not sure. So we talk about the inefficiency of, of, uh, and, and incoherent outcomes of, of licensing. In the United States, uh, black women like to have their hair braided, that is, tied in fancy ways. Uh, now, many people learn that at a very young age, especially in these communities where there are people that like to have it done. In some of the states in the United States, it's illegal to do that unless you've been to a beautician school for five years, paying lots of money to be able to do that. Because it's too dangerous for humanity if you do that without that license. It's crazy. These kind of things are crazy. So if you've observed these instances in, in Guatemala, you need to help publicize them, and, to, and even just discuss them over dinner, just to get it floating around into the overall discussion. We need to understand that privileges violate the rule of law. Subsidies, giving a particular group advantages because they are members of a particular group, violates the rule of law. People are not being treated equal. The whole premise of the modern uh, experiments with democracy was this equality before the law that no law would give any individual a privilege that was not available to every individual but every legislation every piece of legislation that comes from your congress or my congress or france or england is all about creating privileges this has got to be better understood and opposed more rigorously now it starts with you. We can't be free unless we are free. I mean, we cannot be free unless you are free. So it's got to start with you. Now, so how do we achieve freedom? Well, we achieve freedom by being ourselves, discovering who we are. Never mind what other people want us to be. Of course, your parents, ooh, it's difficult, but still, you you're going to have to find a way within their expectations of you and your willingness to give in to that. But in any case, to be free, we have to be allowed to discover who it is we really are. Now, in order to do that, we got, everybody's got to be seen as being equally valuable. Because even if you don't like what other people are doing or think it's wasteful or foolish... We have to respect it. We have to tolerate it. And it's, it's something that, that everyone must be treated equally. The English have a, an expression. The quality of your character depends upon how well you treat people beneath you rather than above you. Because anybody can kiss the... Uh, can be friendly with people above them. But it's how you treat the people that, that may depend upon you or that, that are struggling or that are, you know, like the, 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 the people, the, these entrepreneurs that are standing at the traffic light selling anacates in season and banana and, and whatever. You should treat them with the same dignity as anyone else. In fact, maybe more, because they are working hard. They're doing something honest. They're doing something productive and useful. You don't have to go to the supermarket to get, I didn't know anacates were in season. Fantastic. I love them. So self-actualization is something that we're struggling to achieve. And it's about, and it requires autonomy and the acceptance of our exceptionalism. We're all exceptional. 
Your mother may have always told you that, but, um, but it's true. We are, and we must accept that in everyone. Not just because our mother said we are, that other people aren't. We all are exceptional. We're all unique. One of the things that we probably accept at this university without challenging is the concept of free will. Because this is what freedom is about. Freedom is about choosing. And choosing is about being able to understand that through your own reasoning, you can decide what is the best thing to do. And moral agency. Now, moral agency is this being accountable. That you are accountable for what it is that you do and how it impacts upon others. You need to be responsible. Again, thinking of this um, mission statement of Francisco Marroquin. One of the things, now, there are many objectivists at this university, or at least some, who are very... Uh, aggressive about trying to convince people that you have no responsibilities for other people. Well, it's a choice. You don't have to care about other people unless you choose to. It's not an obligation. And it should not be a legal requirement. Because if it's a legal requirement, that ends any possibility of it being a moral act. Because if there's compulsion or force behind an action, there's no morality in it. You did it because you were forced to do it. But if you do it because I want to help her, she needs something. And for whatever reason, I am willing to do so. So an act is only moral if it's the outcome of voluntary choice. And this is something that politicians pretend otherwise. We're doing this. We're forcing you to do this because it's morally correct. <laughs> These guys wouldn't know morals if it bit them on the backside. They make up stuff. They don't understand. The, they, they miss that sermon at the church when the priest explained to people that Moral acts are only those which are chosen based upon your own moral sense. So humans must be free to follow their own idea who they are and to achieve their subjectively chosen life purposes. Now, there's no guarantee that those life purposes that you have in mind for yourself will be successful because success will be measured by how well, you interact with other people, ultimately. Right? Because if, if you're an entrepreneur, it's how successful your business is. If you're a celebrity trying to be a performer, it's how people react to what you do. There's no guarantee, but you should be able to choose that. And then you test the value added from your individual life activities in terms of how other people respond. Well, that's what it's about. Now, okay, so let's see how we might expand human liberty. I'll give you some ideas. One of the things is it's about messaging. So we've got to have a good message. We've got to have a good delivery of this message. In India, I'm part, I'm, I'm affiliated with a, an NGO there, and they started a film project, a contest that was about livelihood. So they invited anyone and everyone in India to shoot video or film about livelihoods. Now, the interesting thing was a lot of people came with sort of interventionist or status or socialist ideas, but the more they explored what makes someone able to be successful in their livelihood? They began to see the government as the enemy. And it was an, an interesting sort of development that, that people were saying, well, we need to let people sell marijuana, you know, whatever it was. Or, or let uh, uh, sex workers, we need to protect sex workers. 
uh, and very often controversial ideas. But this was a very successful project in luring in lots of people with different beginnings, but shaping their thinking through focusing on this idea of livelihood. How do you make a living? Do you have a right to make a living? Who has a right to interfere with your trying to make a life for yourself? Using social media. Of course, you guys are engaging in this. I mean, my generation knows the mainstream media. Leave us to that. You know, we don't know how to do the things you... I don't know anything. I never watch TikTok or something. Sometimes accidentally it pops up. But these are ways... I mean, these are enormous opportunities at very low cost to be able to create a new message. And you need to be more creative in that regard. I have a friend in Mongolia who's a libertarian stand-up comic. Now, I found this to be quite remarkable. I, I, I don't understand Mongolian, but I would go to this comedy club and, and it was packed with young people. Packed! I don't know whether... I know that there have been and maybe are some comedy clubs here. I don't know how successful they are. But this friend of mine, they were extremely successful. And he's become a, a social influencer through Instagram, promoting these libertarian ideas in a comic way. I mean, comedy is really a great communica communicative skill, great skill for communicating with people. So some of you may know people that are hopefully somewhat libertarian or contrarians because contrarians are going to go against the established narrative. And the established narrative in most countries is usually conservative, oriented towards promoting the state and so on. So these are things that could be done. Start reading groups. It was something I always used to do. When I would go to a new university, I'd go to the philosophy department and I'd go to the political science department. Of course, I was in economics and I'd say, okay, give me three or four of your best students and I'll, I'll start a reading group with them. It's just extracurricular. We get together, and, you know, get, I'd get the best and brightest philosophy students, the best and brightest political science students and expose them to the ideas that I'm discussing here. And it was, it was really wonderful. I mean, it was an educational process for everyone. They challenged my students, my students challenged them and so on. Now, I think this is even more effective if you can start one with high schoolers. I mean, these, this would be a very interesting project. Go back to your, own, your former high school and ask the teachers if you can meet with some of the students or contact them or after school and give them some simple readings. I think most great books have been translated into Spanish. But, you know, if you, you may improve upon them. I have a friend in China who does translations. There were dozens of translations of human action. And he read them in Chinese. And he said, this is rubbish. These people, they didn't understand the ideas. They just translated it. And it may be the case with some Spanish translations of works that promote these ideas of human liberty. Go back and look at them. See if they need to be retranslated. Make them available. And um, so another thing, become rich. And give money to Francisco Marroquin so they can invite people like me back. <laughs> but these, this is important. This, this was the idea that Hayek gave to a British businessman. He said, your ideas are Fantastic. What can I do to help promote? He said, become rich and start think tanks, start NGOs. And he did that. Now, there's now a global network based upon the work. And that one piece of advice of a, 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 an initial meeting between Hayek and this businessman. So th that could be very productive here. Promote livelihood issues to marginalized people. In this country, there's a lot of campesinos, people that are living indigenous people living quite remote from the city, find ways to reach them to promote livelihoods. Now, one way that many of these people may be living in areas that are not easily accessible by road or quite difficult, 
But you could help them with their livelihoods by putting perhaps, I mean, handicrafts. A lot. I, when I first came here, I bought a lot of handicrafts. These beautiful textiles that were handmade by these uh, Indian ladies in Chichi or wherever I went at that time. Masks and all that. Put these online. Help them find a way to sell to a wider audience. Or maybe, uh, I mean, th this could be a summer project or, a, you know, tomorrow go and discover because it's a day off. How can you get involved to help those people understand that their livelihoods and their lives are valuable and that, that you uh, would like to help them? Engage religious opinions that oppose human liberty. Now, this is one of the great ironies of many religious leaders. Almost none of them ever owned a business. They never hired or fired workers. They never had to accumulate capital. So wealth is just something that's out there. Oh, you've got a lot, so we'll take some of yours and give it to them. Wait a minute. Well, if you don't know how that wealth was created, then you have no understanding of the consequences of using the force of the state to take away from someone who has rightfully, legally, and peacefully acquired something to give to someone else just because you decide they should have more. I, I, I mean, we really need to challenge those kind of observations. One of the things that we are constantly facing is debating. Now, in order to, to have a good debate, you have to know what the other person is thinking. What is their position? So you can... I was very successful in debating Marxists because I read Marxism. They didn't read my stuff. They were always disadvantaged. You can win a debate much more readily against an opponent by knowing their perspective and then arguing at their level, not at yours. So it may be I had a lot of students who tried to argue in favor of Marxism. Well, they weren't very well educated. They had some impressions maybe from other professors or whatever. So you don't, you don't speak at a high PhD level about that. You, you try to connect at the level of your opponent. You have to be patient, uh, be humble. You have to master their position because you know how they're going to try to defend it. And then you know the weaknesses. You seek common grounds. Uh, you accept that your opponents, their beliefs are just as sincere as yours are. They're not stupid. They're not dishonest. Assume that they are just like you. Uh, now, this idea of social justice is a complete rubbish idea because justice can only be measured in terms of of its impact on individual humans. Social justice is an aggregated concept that is arbitrary, that's ideologically influenced, and driven by politics. But you need to be cautious about the way you attack it. Uh, now, uh, some activism may be counterproductive. If you're doing it too much, you know, you know I've, I've had people say, oh yeah, blah, 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 right? I mean, you may have heard that if you engage people, trying to convince them. Yeah, I've heard that before. So you have to be careful. What you really need to, to establish is that a system of voluntarism, which is what the market is, voluntarism is superior to the welfare state. That is, people will have better lives if they are allowed to discover what it is they want to achieve for themselves. Now, that, uh, So we need to develop moral truths and spread them. Um, we, uh, urge reading. One of my friends, <laughs> I envy him. He, he, he's Brazilian and he's, he's quite well off. And one of his hobbies or activities is that he hangs around with beauty pageants. So he's surrounded by beautiful young women. Now it turns out he's very libertarian. And one of the things he started doing is he would carry books like Atlas Shrugged or, uh, uh, in, in Portuguese, of course, and give to these beautiful young women who, many of whom were not well-educated and have a distinctive idea about 
life other than beauty pageants. And two things would happen. First of all, they might actually read them. But the other thing is these beautiful women would be seen with these, these books and be photographed with them. And people go, wow, this beauty queen is reading Atlas Shrugged? I mean, I mean, it was a really interesting way of promoting the image of these books. Now, so giving celebrities or whatever. I actually, I gave a copy of my book to Milton Friedman once. And he was photographed. I mean, we were out doing things and he, he happened to be photographed with my book. I'm like, oh, that was really great. You know, I felt good about it. Anyway, uh, MEMS, I could be, you know, but they have limited purpose though. Citizens tend to be shallow in their interest. I mean, you know, people are more interested in El Clasico than they are in the public policy issues of the day. Just the nature of our being. Public choice economics, I don't know if any of you have had access to public choice economics, but this gives us some very interesting insights into how special interests, rather than general interests, decide on public policy. We need to be careful. Slogans don't work in the long run. Careful arguments do. We're talking about sort of a, a social engineering, if you will. So how do we get to having new voluntary institutions and practices? Well, the sharing economy is something that your generation has been involved in, the gig economy. This is a new approach to uh, uh, interactions in market practice. Cryptocurrencies. Uh, startup cities like the Zedes in Honduras, as I mentioned, the, the sharing economy. And we need to find evidence that the voluntaristic market-based behavior, human liberty is a moral value. It's a moral value. Self-ownership is what it's all about. The rule of law should be seen as not allowing privileges. The evidence of the real world impacts are around us. Obviously, so for example, if we look at what happened, for if we, we can go back here, and human progress did not really begin until the 1700s and then into the Industrial Revolution. This is when markets became more and more part of our lives. So what happened is that poverty plummeted until the pandemic policies ended the decline in poverty. Pandemic policies drove poverty back up. Uh, human progress, if we want to have human progress, it required new thinking. So what we saw is that in the 1800s, people began to realize the fact that the way to become rich is to get people to cooperate with you and to provide them with things that are of value to them. And so there would be these social gains. So Deidre McCluskey, who is a honorary doctor at this university, wrote a trilogy about this idea that what had to happen for humanity to really have sustained progress, we had to think differently about our human interactions, with, in particular in the market. Now, Fast forward to the 20th century, where the paramount leader of China summarized everything in Adam Smith's great work and Deidre McCluskey's. To be rich is glorious. He communicated to the Chinese people, if he becomes rich, he'll make the rest of us better off because the only way he can become rich is by selling us things that we are valuing more than what we give up. Deng Xiaoping, in one sentence change the thinking of the Chinese people and change the world. So to be more wealthy personally, you need to create opportunities for mutual gains. So the ingenuity, the, the creativity of free people, what McCluskey called the commercial bourgeoisie, uh, this led to more markets. More markets led to specialization and division of labor. Combining that with technology, we have rising productivity, rising income, and human progress. Now, we didn't get human progress under Soviet communism. We got repression. We got genocide. So, the end of the message is, leave other people alone. Let them find out who they are. 
and they'll find their own happiness and their own sense of prosperity. And I wish you luck with it. Thank you.